The, what I'm presenting is uh, the result of a research that uh, uh, Arun in uh, Cape Town and uh, we people in Florence are carrying out on behalf of UNDP with some assistance from, uh, for, for data and other things from the Friends of the World Bank. And I think that uh, Kathleen has focused on measurement. I will me mention measurement. But basically, my own question is not uh, whether inequality in Africa is high or low, but whether it has changed. And uh, I think that in doing that, um, how do I press this one? OK. By doing this one, first of all, we uh, uh, try to measure the trends, not the levels, but the trends. And to do that, we built a, a database on purpose, which has many of the shortcomings that Kathleen mentioned. But I think that so far, this is the, the better instrument one can use. And second, we try to explain. And we try to explain using eight categories of goods, of variables. Number three, we have done some uh, macro panel regression on the determinants of inequality. And we know some change for the better, some change for the worst. And finally, we conclude. Now. Um, now, this database is what we call it uh, the World Income uh, Inequality, the, the Integrated Inequality Database. And uh, what basically we did, we selected all the databases, and on the basis of that, comparing all the statistics, selected the one which, uh, which made more sense. We have a protocol, and basically uh, we selected 29 countries out of uh, 44 or 48. So we don't have all of Africa, but we have 90% of the population and GDP of Africa. And that is about 280, 240 Gini coefficient between 1991 and 2011. Now then, of course, we, uh, for the country selected, if we had gaps and if the trends are smooth in the observed points, basically we interpolated because in the end we want to do uh, regression analysis. Now, the four countries, depending on the shape of their own trends, were aggregated in four subgroups. Now, if you measure uh, inequality for these 29 countries in this period, basically you find a, a sort of a surprising result. Inequality falls, both with the weighted data and unweighted data. But this is actually conceals more than reveal. And if you divide it by the four um, categories, depending on their own trends, you come up with very different uh, trends. And here, this is why I started talking about bifurcation. Now, I mentioned that because before this work, we did one on Latin America, which shows a sort of a universal decline in income inequality in Latin America. Africa is different. Africa is bifurcating. Now, if, you, if I reduce the period to 2001, 2011, Basically, you have something like 60% uh, uh, of the countries which have fallen in inequality, but 40% of the population, and 40% uh, of the countries which are rising, and 60% uh, because there is uh, Nigeria alone. So basically, the whole argument is that Africa is very different from Latin America. Some countries are doing better. Uh, think perhaps of Ethiopia, and others are doing worse. Think of Nigeria and South Africa. Now, the first argument is to say is, uh, now we try to explain. Growth, OK, if you look at all the sample, no relation. The interpolated line is completely flat. If you look at the falling inequality, there is no relation. If you look at the countries with rising inequality, you do see that there is a little bit of an increase in inequality together with uh, the increase in growth, which is not what you would expect. Normally, we would expect sort of a downsloping uh, line. So growth per se is not a good predictor. And so then the pattern of growth is what uh, basically is important. And here I come to a point that has basically been commented by Aron. And uh, if I lo we look at the growth pattern, we look at the changes in the value at the structure. So here you see that uh, the dark blue line uh, um, is mining and utilities in the middle. With the, uh, and you should read it on the right scale. Basically, you see mining and utilities are increasing. The purple, uh, sorry, the orange one is manufacturing, which is declining. Then you have services, which is rising. It doesn't look much because it is on the left scale, but it is declining. Then you have construction, which is rising. And then you have uh, 
agriculture, which as you would expect is declining. So the bottom line is that agriculture is declining and this is fine. Uh, mining is rising and this is, well, I don't know. And manufacturing is falling. So basically we are starting to think uh, of, uh, uh, we are in a pattern of growth where there is uh, uh, a change in the structure of uh, GDP, which is what we may call suboptimal. Now, if you look at these countries, you will see, just look at the, the two left. Uh, I mean, these are countries where the share of GDP, uh, depending on uh, export and mining, the export and mining of, of uh, oil and mining resources, is more than GDP. So for these eight or nine countries, the, between 90, 2000, and 2010, basically the share of mining goes up tremendously. And then if you look at the second part, basically that goes up uh, substantially as well. So this is the rise in uh, oil and mining, which is driving uh, the share in GDP, but which is also, uh, for the reason that Harun mentioned, capital intensive, uh, political rents, uh, capital flight, and so on and so forth, drives inequality. Now then what we did, we took a big data set and we looked at the relation between value added shares and inequality. The one on the left is agriculture. The more agriculture you have, the lower is Gini. The second one is trade and restaurant, also egalitarian. Then construction. Then you have manufacturing, which is basically neutral. So if you create more jobs in, in manufacturing, you're not running into the risk of increasing inequality. And then we look at the bad guys, finance, insurance, and real estate and business services. The more you have it, have of it basically the higher will be inequality. Mining, we knew that. Now, community and social and personal services as well. And then, surprise, surprise, government services. So the more you move your GDP towards this sector, the higher will be inequality. And this is what has happened in many countries of Africa. Now, there is another variable which needs to be looked at. Uh, in this process of changing the structural pattern goes quite a bit with urbanization. Just read only the first two lines. Now, the first one is the less developed countries. And so it, the, there is the rate of urbanization. So in 2010, that 46% of people in urban areas. Then you look at SSA, and you see that they have 35%. And underneath is the change in relation to the prior 10 years. And you see that during the 70s and, and, and 80s, Africa more or less were urbanizing at the same speed. But then you see that from the 90, 2000, 2010, basically there's a very slow uh, pace of urbanization, which means that if the pattern of urbanization continues as it has been occurring during the last 20 years, we'll have more people in public administration, services, trade, and so on and so forth, which are unequalizing. So this pattern of urbanization may become, may increase further inequality. Now, uh, now then, what? So one first point is that basically the pattern of uh, structural transition is suboptimal, and uh, and then we come back to that why. Now the second one is what happens to the within sector inequality, and here there are some good news. Now I've been looking at Africa for many years, and I remember that the food production per capita been declining between 1960 and 90. Uh, what, 1980 or something like that, you know. Now here, the countries, these are a group of countries, and if you look in relation to 2004 and 2010, basically, um, food production per capita has been rising. And it has been rising, basically, because of increasing yields in, uh, in agriculture. And this is the pattern of growth we do want. Now, these are both from, uh, I mean, you see these are increases which are problematic, so they're not straight lines. But during the last period, there are increasing land yields. And in some other countries like Burkina, and here we have Mikhail Grimm who has pointed out that, basically uh, output has increased, per capita has increased, but basically by expanding the land surface. Now, the pattern of growth in agriculture, I think, is central to the uh, uh, inequality in Africa. And I think the question is that, uh, first of all, it, it, uh, it depends on land distribution. Aren't we, didn't we say that for the last 50 years? Okay, so there is, this chart confirms that in Africa, land genie and inequality genie and uh, income genie or consumption genie are correlated. So the question is that what happened to land distribution? Now, I think there have been a lot of uh, titling program, land titling, titling program, which have been going on. 
And uh, <clears throat> there has been a drastic land reform in 75 in Ethiopia, which has been confirmed, and many uh, other changes in that country. Then there has been land certification, but then there has been also a very fast increase in land concentration, in uh, population growth in rural areas, that where the land frontier is exhausted, basically they lead to increasing land concentration. And then there is the issues of land grabs, which uh, is uh, debatable, but uh, can be disequalizing. Now, one issue is, nobody has mentioned that, but what happens to the demography? Just read the top. Now, less developed region, 226 to 133. SSA, 238 to 265. Growth rate of the population. Niger, which is a country I visited two or three times, the growth rate of the population goes from 279 to 385. Population doubles in 13 years. And I think that uh, when we try this in, uh, in the panel later on, we find no, no effect because you see the scatter, you see the, the population growth rate, which are on the, vertic on, on the horizontal axis, they are more or less all the same, while the genes are different. So on, uh, on macro data is uh, irrelevant. But uh, on uh, micro data, it's quite different. I mean, uh, the richest households have lower dependency rate than the poorer households. So, so then you have a, a huge pressure on uh, poor families uh, uh, due to continued fast population. So I think that the population issue ought to be brought out. Uh, one of the reasons, I don't know, uh, s s sorry. Yeah. Um, now, what happens to the second set of variables? What happened to macro variables? Well, macro variables, I mean, I think that uh, there has been a, a general stabilization in Africa. There is a nice book by Ben Ondulo and companies. So you see that during the last decade, average import tariff, so there's been a massive trade liberalization, balanced budget, is it min minus 0 0.7, low inflation, and uh, real exchange rate, which has appreciated. Now, why as, uh, what is the effect of uh, uh, trade liberalization on uh, production structure? Okay, this is Malawi, which is uh, two or three countries with a micro decomposition. So you see that the share of manufacturing on the right scale uh, basically correlates very closely with the tariff rate. Basically, if you liberalize, you are exposed to steep foreign competition and you are losing share in manufacturing. So one of the reasons why manufacturing doesn't grow is because of trade liberalization. I mean, this is in, at least in Malawi. Now, what happens to schooling? Is uh, human capital formation um, progressed? Well, I think that, again, Aaron showed some of the pictures, some of the data. So there is huge improvement in primary education, which is on the left scale. And there is a much more contained improvement in secondary education. Now, if secondary education improves very little, it means the average year of education of the labor force will be small. And we know this very well uh, established relation between uh, rate of uh, number of years of education and the Gini coefficient of the human capital distribution. And up to about six years to nine years, depend on the countries considered, th this goes up. And so if the gene of human capital goes up, the, the Gini goes up as well. Now, and then furthermore, this, uh, this uh, secondary education is poorly distributed. The green line, this is Chico's, thank you. The, basically, this is the enrollment rate of the rich and the blue are the enrollment rate of the poor. So, which means that the, not only there is not enough human capital, but the human capital belongs to the better off families. Now, there is, uh, altogether, there is some evidence, however, that uh, the spending, despite what Chico showed, I mean, uh, you know, that there is some evidence that increase uh, uh, social spending, the orange bars, this is for Africa as a whole, so it doesn't tell you much, and they tend to bring down the genie. So the, so, and so the social, um, social spending has had some positive effect on, uh, it seems. Now, how about, why is Africa growing so much? Arun mentioned that seven out of 10, the countries are, uh, fast growing country are from Africa. Yes, but why are they growing? Well, one is China, terms of trade. And uh, so the terms of trade, and then uh, the question is, it, are terms of trade equalizing or unequalizing? And the answer is that in the case of Africa, we'll see then by regression, uh, you see terms of trade increase not only for oil, but basically also for the 
producer of agricultural commodities, basically they tend to be equalizing because the many are agricultural products for these countries, but not for the uh, non-agricultural countries, for the uh, mineral countries. Now, then everybody talks about democracy, Africa is becoming more democratic, and then here you, you have a peak in ethnic wars, so actually political conditions have improved. Revolutionary wars were already low, and also adverse regime, regime change have, have been changing, have been declining. So this seems to be to have a positive effect, but you will see we don't find none. HIV AIDS, you see at the bottom HIV is highly unequalizing. All the micro studies show that very clearly. And then we see that from around 2000, it falls not much in all regions. So we want to test that as well. And finally, technological shocks. These are people with cell phones and internet. And the argument is, well, they are market integrating, and therefore, so the poor may, may also do better because of that. Now, the relation with Gini is very weak. And then what we do? Then we try to do a, a test on a macro panel. We try to test all these six or seven groups. Now, the test is done for the moment with LSTV estimates. We are proceeding with the GMM. And uh, some of the um, estimate, which we, some of the data, I mean, I don't want to, but basically are basically growth and growth pattern, the first five. Then human capital and uh, the second block. Then macro variables, the third and shocks, 13, 14, 15, then external factors, uh, 16 to 19, and then governance. And basically, we, what we see is that, except for those who are marked in blue, uh, the, this means that uh, the, the, the results are what we expected. And not, now, we, we did not expect all the variables to be significant, so with three stars, because uh, some variables on macro panel, for instance, like uh, the percentage of the urban population or age dependency ratio, they tend to be not significant on macro panel, but they are on micro panels, you know? So, so by and large, the, 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 what we do find seems to be supporting to a good extent the hypothesis which we formulated. Now, the conclusions is basically is that one, uh, and here we agree with, uh, with our own, that um, basically there is a major problem with the, the, stru the structural transition in Africa. I mean, there is an issue of uh, reprimarization. So Africa is losing manufacturing, is going back to the mines. And uh, Africa is only in part of Africa. There is an increase in productivity in the la on the land. And there is a premature ter tertiarization of the economy with many people being poorly paid. So GDP per se is not, uh, is not a good thing. Now, the second variable which is important is that the secondary education has increased, but not enough. So it tends to uh, uh, increase the, the inequality in the distribution of the human capital. Now, now um, uh, there is an issue of population. I think there is no slowdown except in Southern Africa. And that actually, I think, is uh, highly inequalizing uh, under given position. So pressure on the land, distress urbanization, dependency rate, wage rates, all these are variables that will be suffering. And this is an issue which is uh, hardly ever discussed. Now, um, macro policy, I think macro policy has been equalizing. The inflation has been, equal, I mean, the fall in inflation has been equalizing. The real exchange rate is appreciating during the last uh, decade, and that is unequalizing. Redistribution, I think that despite the, the limited extent of uh, uh, social programs uh, in relation to Latin America, we do find that uh, it's progressive, except in uh, uh, not in mineral enclaves because of the political economic factors which have been, which have been mentioned. Um, the last one, I think that uh, the changes in, in external conditions which were not particularly favorable for Latin America. They've been, uh, the terms of trade have been equalizing, but not for the mining or countries, because remittances have been equalizing against all theory. I mean, most of the theory says that remittances are equalizing. FDI have been uh, mostly in the resource sector, so they've not been equalizing. Aid is non significant, but HIPIC has been. 
shocks the fall of HIV in war intensity has been equalizing. The diffusion of, of uh, cell phones and that techno shocks not significant. In democracy, we don't know how to measure it. So by and large, there seems to be a pattern of, uh, of explanation which might be useful to explain what has happened in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you.